Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, give this overview lecture on uh, fundamentals of electrochemistry investigation by uh, electron microscopy. And um, I'm sorry for not being able to be with you for this uh, workshop. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, Jordi and, and Thomas uh, and the rest of the folks here at UIC will uh, do a great job in, in taking care of you. Um, so I prepared this lecture to give you uh, an overview of the field of electron microscopy, in particular transmission electron microscopy, and also uh, what uh, we can do by uh, uh, using in situ electron microscopy to understand those fundamentals. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, a lot of labs and, and collaborators uh, along these uh, several years of our, our research work on electrochemistry with TEM. And uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the students who have done a great job and also the postdoc who has uh, been a tremendous help for my lab. Okay. So, um, in, in this workshop, uh, you're going to be exposed to a, a lot of challenges and issues related to uh, electrochemical energy devices and, in particular, uh, lithium ion battery systems. Um, from a material point of view, these systems undergo um, uh, a charge discharge reactions which induces um, uh, a, a lot of change in the material chemistry and, and material behavior. Uh, examples of, for example, the thermal runaway issue in, in batteries involve um, several chain reactions um, from SCI uh, decomposition to electrolyte decomposition and eventually uh, electrode decomposition, which uh, we need to understand that and, and we need to better uh, find better mit uh, mitigation strategies to address the issue. Another issue in, uh, in, in a, you know, electrochemical battery devices is that um, we have um, a lot of volume expansion, a stress generation due to the intercalation, the intercalation of ions uh, within the structure which eventually results into cracks and, and failure of the electrodes. Another sort of uh, failure uh, and um, uh, issues that we face in um, these systems is dendritic growth of lithium, which uh, uh, this, this basically work uh, it, it's, it's trying to simulate and, and model this behavior, but it involves uh, uh, basically some sort of uh, uh, interplay between SEI formation and uh, the electrode deposition of the lithium on the electrodes, which uh, eventually um, uh, might result in the failure of our energy system. Um, we also have um, uh, several, um, sometimes several phase transformations um, and, uh, and sometimes capacity loss due to the SEI formation or other uh, sort of uh, lithium entrapment into the uh, structure of our electrodes which um, we need to understand and, and better answer the questions of what are the phases are forming and what's the uh, material issues associated with this capacity loss. Uh, not to mention uh, uh, basically the structure of SEI, um, there is uh, still ongoing uh, debates and discussion in the scientific community whether SEI is good or bad and uh, what should be the characteristics of the SEI. Um, to allow for the lithium ion transport, uh, helps the electrodes to be protected from the electrolytes and, and so forth. So we need to uh, uh, understand these systems and uh, through the years uh, there have been a, a lot of different characterization techniques uh, that has been developed to understand the issues that I just mentioned. Um, if, if you look into the literature, uh, there are spectroscopy techniques, Raman, FDIR, or electron microscopy techniques, um, some uh, property characterization, uh, and, and lots of imaging and, and other techniques have been developed to understand what's going on at the electrode level or at the electrolyte level from both experimental uh, sort of configuration as well as modeling simulation uh, perspectives. So what uh, I'm going to cover today is mostly involved with the uh, application of uh, transmission electron microscopy. Um, some of you folks might be already familiar with um, uh, X-ray techniques. Um, X-ray and TEM 
provides, uh, in many cases, complementary information, which uh, we can better analyze and, and use that information to better analyze the behavior of our uh, electrochemical uh, systems. Uh, while X-ray is, uh, is applicable in many cases for bulk and, and larger scale understanding of the behavior, um, uh, in, in the battery systems, we go to very, very small scales to the nanometer angstrom level sort of resolutions and, and we try to look into that uh, behavior. There are other techniques of uh, uh, X-ray. This can go from larger scale to very small scales. But at the at the single uh, you know few atom layer or few atom locations, um, being able to collect uh, chemical information and the structural information is very unique to electron microscopy techniques. So, um, if you want to look into the ways that uh, electron microscopy technique can help you, is is important that we look into. Um, um, how electron microscopy evolved along the way and um, what's the basic uh, fundamentals of this system. Um, for many years, um, optical microscopy uh, was the main uh, driving force for understanding uh, um, basically um, uh, materials and, and system issues. Um, if you look into the maximum resolution that you can get from the op optical microscope, um, you'll see that you know there is dependency on the photon wavelength as well as the numerical aperture of your system. So, in order to increase this maximum resolution, in order to basically help this resolution to go up, the, the main parameter that can be controlled uh, is uh, wavelength of the incident uh, energy that we use to invest, investigate the structure. So, uh, with the electron microscopy, now we are using wavelength of electron, so that will help a lot in terms of increasing this maximum resolution. And this wavelength is directly uh, inversely proportional to the uh, voltage of the uh, system and the microscope. So it means that uh, if we can increase this as much as possible, then we can get you know, wavelengths that are going to help us to understand the um, behavior of atom uh, structures at the atomic scales. So in order to now generate uh, uh, wavelengths and an electron, then we, we deal with uh, electron source or gun that will help to uh, basically uh, generate these electrons. Um, if you look at some of the fundamentals of the ways that electron is being generated, in many cases we need to heat up our um, filament or source in order to get enough current to, to, that we can use this to generate a signal and image. So uh, this, this gun is basically incorporation at the very top of usually of our electron beam. Uh, systems or TMs and uh, electron beams shoot over the samples that are typically deposited on the on the grid and uh, and typically your sample could be you know flakes could be particles could be tin films um, a, a variety of form you can you can deposit your samples on this sort of grids in the order of three millimeters and the electron beam uh, basically uh, transmits through the sample. That's where the name of transmission electron microscopy comes from. It will be transmitted. It passes through some uh, lenses, projection lenses, and eventually will be projected on a screen, a black and white image like this. And understanding the contrast difference between uh, you know this very dark region versus you know. Uh, a little bit grayish region versus you know a lighter color regions. These are all um, uh, requires basic understanding of image contrast mechanism and image contrast formation in order to investigate uh, what we can see and uh, what we can interpret by observation of these images. So uh, this uh, formation of an image uh, from a basically uh, a source. Um, it, it has its own challenges, and uh, one of the major challenges is the aberration of the lenses, which, for example, here you see the, the rays that are uh, basically interacting with the lens at 
different distances are going to be focused at a different imaging plane and therefore the P prime which is supposed to be the image of P is going to have some sort of blurry because of uh, this uh, inherent uh, aberrations in the lenses which we call it a spherical aberration. So, um, so resolution of electron microscopy was limited uh, to, to for many years because of these aberration issues. And, uh, and it was um, back in um, 1990, uh, around the age, uh, decade of 1990 and 2000, that there was a lot of development to correct this uh, aberration issue. And that's why um, aberration corrected electron microscopy were born. And uh, in this sort of uh, system, basically, um, these uh, arrays that have been uh, deflected out of the lenses are going to be uh, pass through quadrupoles or uh, hexapoles and they are going to be corrected in terms of their location and, and the behavior and this is an example of one of these corrected systems. So uh, if you can add this corrected to your electron microscope then you can get far better resolution, um, image resolution and also you can get far better chemical resolution in your uh, analysis. So this is an example of one of the electron microscopes. Um, this is where you can observe your sample. Um, this is where you input your sample. And the CS correctors, um, is which basically are spherical corrections. Um, they are, uh, these lenses are, are placed above the sample. And this is electron beam gone. And, uh, and that, that's basically the overall configuration. And the you know, EELS config system that are, you are going to use to understand the fingerprints and, the, electro and the, the chemistry of your sample at very small scales. You can you do EELS, you can also do sometimes EDS uh, using this detectors. Um, and then uh, for imaging, many times now we use um, HADAF imaging, which is sensitive to very heavy elements. And there are newer detectors that can do light element imaging, we call it ABF. And these are all can be used to um, image the structure. So if you want to compare a, a, a non-corrected microscope versus a corrected microscope, as I just already discussed, there, you're going to have a, a, a disk of uh, um, basically uncertainty in the image or, or, or fuzzy image. And the probe is not quite sharp compared to the case when all the beams are converged in the point. So you're going to get far better current density at the point which is going to help you to get far better uh, image resolution. This is an example of the uh, platinum catalyst systems where you can observe now the atomic uh, positions and atomic columns while here you see some sort of uh, fuzzy image making it difficult to um, uh, know about the atomic order in this particular catalyst. So by that uh, innovation um, um, you know, when light microscopes were changed to electron sources, then the resolution reached to about an angstrom and maybe a little bit lower than angstrom. And then uh, by the aberration corrected microscope, we have had several fold of improvement into resolution. And now we are um, reached to a point that we can do maybe about 0.5 angstrom. And uh, people are still pushing this to go um, below 0.5 angstrom. But this should be good enough to, to look into the individual atoms and uh, that's uh, uh, unprecedented resolution capability that you can gain. So um, if you have an electron microscope, especially if you uh, switch to a stem configuration, it means that you convert uh, your beam to, a, to basically a, a very small a spot on the surface of your sample and assuming your sample has some sort of crystallinity or, or, or uh, even could be amorphous, then you are going to have a scattering and uh, basically uh, um, uh, change of energy of the electrons that, in, that are incident to uh, this sample. And you can use detectors to image this, basically, um, um, this atomic structure. Uh, you can move this, uh, raster it over the surface, and uh, you can come up with images that like this. You show you will, you are going to see a, a bright spots. It indicates that the atomic column uh, perpendicular to the screen. And uh, you can also have 
uh, uh, light element imaging. So in case, for example, you are trying to do um, sodium or lithium imaging, um, this capability is very useful for that application. This is an example that we are looking at uh, how much electrons uh, they lost energy by passing through the sample. And we call this yields or electron uh, energy loss spectroscopy. Um, here we see a case that we are able to image directly the position of lithium and the, look and the um, quantification of that result. If you look into uh, the X-rays that could be produced by uh, interaction of this electron and the sample, then you can do X-ray analysis, and that's typically what all we know as EDAX or EDS sort of uh, maps of the sample here. This uh, green and, uh, and, and red is indicates that the position of gallium and arsenide within a sample. So um, typically, um, if you use electron microscopy, uh, if you use a conventional type of holders, um, this is how it looks like. Um, uh, this is basically um, uh, some of the connections to, to be used to make the tilt the sample. And, uh, and, and we typically put our sample uh, at the very tip of the holder. Uh, it is usually the samples are deposited on this uh, grids, copper grids, or, or carbon lacy, or, or other sort of uh, materials you can use for the background. And, and this inserted um, basically at the middle uh, of, of a column. And, uh, and we can get any nice images like this, especially if you have an aberration corrected. So if you have corrected for the spherical uh, uh, issues and, and errors, then you can get nicely position of atoms here. This is a work that, that uh, our group did, uh, and we were able to image the position of uh, lithium observing by this uh, contrast in the images. Um, so, uh, so this is cool uh, that you can look into the structure of your uh, sample. One thing is missing in this sort of an, uh, um, conventional imaging techniques is that um, we don't have much information or we don't gain money, much information about the, uh, the pro processing parameters, about the performance, what's the properties of this uh, image and uh, what's basically if we can do to um, uh, understand the correlation between the structure and these uh, properties, performance and processing. So, um, so in conventional electron microscopy images, um, uh, imaging, you can get nice um, image of the structure, know about the location of the atoms or so, or the chemical composition. But if you want to make a connection between the behavior of your sample, then uh, you might need to do some post-mortem analysis. So that's uh, um, basically some of the information that is missing has inspired the community to go after techniques that can help us to better make a correlation between this information and the structure. And that's where it really the in-situ electron microscopy uh, can make great contribution. Um, along the years, um, the, uh, I mentioned about the tip of the holder. So along the years, there has been great development to improve the holder design in order to allow you to induce some sort of stimuli or measure the properties of the materials. And, uh, and, and there are several reviews in the field that you can take a look into in terms of the design of the stages and uh, the holders. I'll show you one example uh, of the holder design by uh, Dense Solution. And uh, in this um, configuration, what you observe is that um, the sample typically at the very tip of the holder, you can tilt it so you can go to different zone axis and different uh, uh, viewing angle. And electrons usually passes through sample and uh, you can get an, a nice image. But one thing you should notice that this space is very limited. So the design of these holders require uh, tremendous um, uh, work, um, careful design in terms of the vacuum, in terms of the configuration of uh, the um, 
the electrodes or, or any sort of um, connections that you put here and into this very small the space that you have uh, in the whole piece gone. And uh, there are nowadays um, three or four major companies that are able to commercialize these systems, uh, but they are typically quite expensive. And at the University of Illinois here at, in Chicago, we have uh, very good access to uh, various uh, holders, including uh, the, the ability to look into materials in the liquid and look, either look into electro deposition or look into um, um, uh, battery dynamics or so. Um, another one is a graphene liquid cell analysis. Um, we are also able to study material under high voltage, and this is a system that we use quite often for the study of, uh, of um, electrodes. Um, we are able to look into materials at low temperature, at high temperature, um, either conventional heating or MEMS based sort of heating. These are all capabilities available at UIC for um, collaborations. <coughs> so uh, we recently uh, uh, made a review of uh, how we can do in situ electron microscopy to understand the battery in the issues and dynamics. And uh, I encourage you to look into this publication if um, you'd like to gain more information. But I try to give you a, a good summary of what we have come up with and what uh, we understand from uh, various research conducted in the field. So, um, a, a, a lithium -ion, a typical lithium ion battery system um, had, could have several issues. I also mentioned at the beginning of my slides. If, if, for example, you are interested to understand the dynamics of dendritic growth, or if you'd like to understand uh, how SEI grow in the surface of your sample, then, uh, in many cases, uh, ability to uh, look at the, uh, the in interfaces of liquid and solid is quite important and there are, fortunately, uh, very nice uh, electrochemical uh, liquid-based systems are available for you to study that uh, issues. Um, another uh, um, um, the challenge could be associated with thermal runaway issues, with how SCI decomposes or how cathodes decomposes. So, um, if you want to, for example, know about the oxygen evolution from oxide based cathodes, that are the major issues for thermal uh, instability in cathodes, then we can look into uh, holders that allow you to uh, heat and, and, and raise the temperature and at the same time would allow you to do chemical and imaging uh, formation. So this sort of heating sort of devices are very uh, useful for that application. If you want to know that uh, how electrodes are um, um, uh, going under a stress uh, during alloying or intercalation or conversion mechanisms, um, what sort of instability or failures exist, then you can use um, some open cell configurations. Uh, I'll show you um, some of the results in that area. Um, this will allow you to observe in the atomic scales that information and that's quite uh, handy and useful. And if you want to look into <coughs> how solid state systems or, or battery, if you want to make a full solid state battery system, then uh, there are um, MEMS based or uh, um, uh, microfabricated devices that are available that allow you to apply a potential to that system and observe the behaviors um, with that system. Um, if you want to do uh, electrochemistry, as I mentioned, uh, you can do uh, you can use uh, uh, a liquid base uh, on microfabricated devices. The advantage of this system that is uh, is able to allow you to flow electrolyte, um, organic, aqueous, and, and or different sort of uh, liquid solution into sample. Um, the part that you need to be careful would be that if that. Um, um, liquid that you flow in, uh, is it corrosive or not, or is it going to have any reaction with the silicon nitride membrane or the silicon um, um, of, uh, of the material that is being used to construct the chip. But typically the, the liquid uh, is going to have a very uh, small thickness, 
typically is less than a micron and the electron passes through the sample and then you can use that the electron that is passing through a sample or transmitting through a sample in order to gain some information. If you don't care about the flow and uh, um, maybe you are looking at particular um, dynamics that doesn't need the flow of the liquid, then one interesting um, system would be to use a graphene liquid based system to, um, to understand the dynamics and this is one of the work that will look into the SDI formation. Um, uh, another sort of system is available is based on the movement uh, is of the, of the uh, manipulators and uh, being ability, have the ability to apply potential on the sample in order to uh, look into the dynamic reactions either at this interface or this in interface and uh, I'm going to show you some results on that configuration. And this is another work uh, where uh, you can basically um, prefabricate the tin film of the battery, do the fab cutting, uh, and put the sample on, on one of these um, membranes, uh, silicon membrane, and then apply potential and then look into what's going on at the interfaces or at, at the electrodes or electrolytes itself. <coughs> so, uh, in order to uh, study um, um, the electrochemical reactions at nanometer and sub-nanometer, the best system to use, uh, at least in my opinion, is the open cell configuration. Um, for the, in this system, because we don't have any sealing membranes, then we can gain resolutions that are uh, far better, uh, could be even 100 times better than um, systems that are using silicon nitride um, or, or any other sort of um, liquid electrolytes to observe the reactions. So uh, if you want to use open cell, uh, um, uh, many times you are worried that you know what sort of liquids we can insert into this because we need to always worry about if electrons uh, are going to have damage or is going to result into evaporation of this electrolyte uh, into the vacuum chamber and maybe affect the electron beam gone. Um, a system that is a kind of electrolyte kind of family that are very um, uh, compatible with the vacuum condition of the electron microscope are based on ionic liquids. We have tested this system before and uh, this is an example of the materials we tested with ionic liquids. Um, they can uh, stay uh, intact for several hours while you do electrochemical research. Um, so, um, so that's something we recommend in terms of if you want to look into electrolyte and if you, you care about flooded geometry during the electrochemical reactions. Another nice system which allows you to do the point contact sort of uh, electrochemistry research is based on um, using lithium metal which has a, a lithium oxide at the surface. In the form of Li2O. And, uh, and when you make a contact between your electrode and this interface, then you can apply a potential and then drive the lithium to go from this side to the other side and uh, then keep track of the behavior again. So, this holder that you see uh, here, as shown in uh, this example, if you look at the very tip area where the sample and everything is located, is, is this box here. And this is a manipulator system that allow you to um, look for the right configuration of electrode that you can bring in contact with your cathodes. Um, this uh, video, um, if uh, run successfully here, yeah. So it basically shows one example of a nano wire in contact with the lithium, something like uh, this approach where uh, you are going, you are seeing um, um, basically quite clear changes in, in the material itself and the progression of the interface uh, toward the, the other contact of, of the electrodes. So that will result in uh, some uh, phase transformation, phase changes which we can be very useful for the fundamentals of the electrochemical reactions. Something I should mention that uh, um, 
There is an interesting concept going on here that could be a subject of more in-depth uh, studies by the electrochemists, especially that um, how the transport of the ions from lithium to this uh, lithium oxide happens. If you look into the literature, there are several works that have shown that um, um, lithium uh, can have a very fast uh, transport in Li2O. I've summarized some of the examples here that uh, people have reported very fast diffusion of lithium in Li2O and that's what we see when we do experiments. Um, uh, that can also happen for sodium, but if you are dealing with some multivalent um, um, systems, for example magnesium, if you try to do the same thing for magnesium and, and, and uh, look into magnesium transport through Mg2 oxide or Mg oxide, um, then you see that the, the kinetics and the dynamics of reactions um, significantly slow down and, um, and there could be some interesting research conducted to better understand of how ion, multivalent ions could transport within those sites. So, um, I will give you some summary of what is it new we understood by doing in situ TM on various electrodes and, and materials. This is an example of the work uh, of several works that has been published in, in the literature on silicon. Um, people have been able to observe uh, the, the lithiation anisotropy. Um, so that was something interesting to see that uh, lithium prefers to uh, um, alloy at certain facets of silicon uh, rather than you know, uh, 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 basically um, isotropic sort of uh, diffusion into silicon. Um, another observation was that uh, there is a self-limiting behavior during lithiation which uh, uh, controlled by the, how much stress is being generated in the sample due to the progress of lithium into the material, which eventually might stop uh, or maybe act as a reverse force into dr uh, driving away uh, the, uh, lithiums from the sample. Another interesting work was that uh, looking at interface between amorphous and solid and see how um, uh, crystalline material will uh, transform to uh, an amorphous phase, and this work was the work that they show a, a peeling mechanism at that interface. Another interesting work has been that looking at um, fracture and failure of electrodes at, with uh, various sizes and uh, being able to uh, draw a better conclusion at what is the safe range for the size of the electrode particles that we can apply in order to avoid the fracture of the systems. Um, a similar sort of um, uh, summary we have done on looking at mechanisms of intercalation. Uh, one of my PhD students, uh, he did uh, about a couple of years research on looking at tunnel-based materials and looking into uh, what are the preferred uh, insertion um, uh, location for the lithium within this uh, uh, tunnel-based systems and uh, what drives uh, a, a John Toller uh, distortion mechanism within these tunnel-based materials. Specifically, we look at manganese oxide materials. Um, the, uh, the progress of phase boundary between a lithium iron phosphate uh, and an iron phosphate and whether you have a solid solution or a two-phase reaction that has been uh, for many years uh, a debate and, and, uh, in the community and this institute of work nicely showed that the interface between these two regions that later on you guys can maybe look into this more if you are interested. Um, another work that I, uh, I think is, is interesting as important has been on looking at um, uh, heterogeneity uh, in the electrodes during lithiation and delithiation process and this work was done in the organic electrolytes uh, by, uh, by keeping track of, of, um, of, of Ill's signature associated with the lithiation phase versus unlithiation phase and this discovery was quite uh, interesting. 
Um, we have also summarized the, in terms of conversion reactions. If you have electrodes that undergo um, uh, basically a, a conversion reaction mechanisms, then you, will, you are going to see a variety of mechanisms that um, before doing in situ T and maybe it was not very clear. Um, examples included that you know the formation of basically a chain phase uh, within the converted material, um, which uh, could this chain phase or this sort of uh, metallic phase behavior can be different um, depending on the um, conversion uh, materials. Uh, these videos are showing examples of um, failures and behavior of, of different electrodes. This is zinc oxide. If you notice that you know this material goes for quite interesting uh, failure during the progress of lithium in the sample, which typically you start by formation of some cracks in, in particular orientation, and then the uh, lithiation of the rest of the structure, which is involved with the uh, uh, conversion reactions. Uh, this is an example of, of, of uh, germanium, uh, basically metals that uh, we see it shows quite uh, plastic behavior and very uh, tough behavior under various, various uh, uh, lithiation, delitiation dynamics that we can now quite visualize the system for further analysis. Interfacial reactions is very important. Uh, uh, where lithium ions like to nucleate on the surface of um, um, electrodes, this is a subject of interesting research. Um, whether uh, at the interface between solid electrolytes and an electrode, if we have any sort of chemical composition change or not, that's another uh, contribution uh, has been on the field. What should be in the solid state system? What should be the minimum thickness for the solid state electrolyte? And how the interface between electrode and a solid state electrolyte will decompose uh, or uh, fail? That has been another uh, interesting research, as well as um, SCI or dendritic formations. We can study the um, uh, dendritic behavior of uh, of electrodes using in situ TM and uh, it will give you a lot of information about the kinetics, the growth of the system and uh, what can be done to basically um, uh, suppress the progression of this uh, lithium uh, dendrites which has a lot of application in terms of um, uh, prevention of failure and thermal runway. So, um, I will show you an example of the work that um, my group did well, as a uh, tin oxide sample. If you look into uh, this material under lithium uh, um, um, penetration or, or lithiation process, you see that there is formation of variety of um, uh, stripes in the sample, which indicates there is anisotropic lithiation followed by a second phase of uh, lithiation, which involves amorphization of the whole structure um, following by the basically lithiation at anisotropic directions. So if you look into, uh, um, if you look into you know, what's going on, you, you see that um, uh, these stripes are, are, are rich with lithium, there is lots of dislocation activities associated with these stripes, which uh, indicates that um, there is uh, plasticity associated with the progress of lithium within the sample and dislocation activity that needs to be taken into account when we do the modeling and uh, want to understand the, the behavior. So we are collaborating with uh, Professor Mashai here in the mechanical engineering department looking at how structs uh, grow in, in these electrodes and uh, what is the associated stress and strains um, that we can understand better the electrochemical reaction under the influence of stress, which um, um, recently uh, the community is paying more attention to that concept. <coughs> um, we have looked into uh, uh, 
Priority of ways to explain uh, why diffusion of ions is preferred in one direction versus another. And we are seeing that uh, the, some of these you know, uh, off-centered octahedral sites in, in tin oxide are um, responsible for, uh, for change of the behavior of lithium ion diffusion. Here we see that along 001 direction, we, have, uh, we get uh, a, m a much lower energy barrier for the uh, diffusion of lithium compared to other uh, directions we see in our samples. Um, so that indicates that uh, fundamental uh, analysis by modeling simulation uh, folks are, are very important to uh, explain the behavior of uh, electrodes and I think uh, 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 um, some coordination between experiments and, uh, and DFD and MD researchers are very important to, to look at that fundamental electrochemical behaviors. Um, here, uh, what you ob observe here is uh, some of these tin oxide samples that we litiate and we'll see the progress of um, 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 lithium stripes in the sample plus formation of some uh, phases that are um, um, very interesting for us because that indicates that we are in, in what stage of litiation we are. And uh, if you look into uh, how, what sort of a structural change involves with this? We'll see that um, this most of this um, dark contrast particle associated with the formation of tin, which indicates that we are in the conversion reaction stage. So we have some sort of small amount of uh, lithium intercalation, and then followed by this uh, conversion reaction, and eventually the formation of alloys. So we can uh, we can uh, use make a summary of all this uh, reaction that is happening, uh, make a basically provide a full story of how lithium is transporting through a sample, how the amorphization happened, how the uh, uh, conversion to tin, and then uh, how the alloying reaction happened. So we can get the full picture by looking at in situ dynamics of. Uh, this electrochemical behavior. Um, I don't want to go too much to the details, but uh, for, for the, our next study, which relates to effect of defects. And that's something uh, that um, is gaining more attention in the community because most of the materials we develop at the smaller scales could contain defects, and uh, we know defects, um, as long as the length of scales were small, they can create um, uh, fundamental change on the, um, on the chemistry or the physical behavior of those uh, particles at, very, at the smallest scales. Um, so, so now going to the nanomaterials and nanoscale system, understanding of how defects interplay with the transport of ions is important. Um, in particular, our team have looked into uh, twin boundaries and uh, this is an example of a nanowire which has a twin boundary which shows quite um, distinct behavior compared to a case where we don't have any twin boundary in the sample and, and we can see that um, the, the electrode behavior is very different in these two cases and if you uh, zoom in a little bit more this is an area where you have a twin boundary and lithium is basically transporting through the sample through this nanowire mostly along this green boundary and then, uh, or twin boundary and then propagating to the rest of the crystal. Um, something we learned from this experiment was that these twin boundaries uh, um, are accommodating channels for the lithium to be transported through them. One, uh, we, we could confirm that by the yields analysis at very small scales. But uh, this, this image uh, shows here an example of a twin boundary and lithium is basically is transporting through this area right before transporting of lithium and here you see that this area shows significant change in the contrast associated with the stress formation into this area which indicates now uh, among all the directions that exist in this sample 
uh, the twin boundary direction is the preference uh, direction for the lithium to move into. And um, this could bring a, a lot of question about what should be the character of the twin boundary to add a faster progress of the lithium as well as a variety of uh, characters and misorientation behavior that needs to be investigated. So, um, uh, some of this work that I show you uh, was mostly related to the open cell configuration, but you can do um, sealed configuration or sealed liquid cell design. And in this case, then you can flow your electrolytes into the TEM. And, uh, you can use MEMS chips like this um, and flow the liquid or electrolyte in between and then let the electron to pass through sample. Of course, you're going to lose resolution, but you can be um, closer to the real condition of uh, how a battery system or how electrochemical device should look like. Um, this is uh, basically the design of the holder, which um, allow you to, in, to, to put chips. This is the O-rings that are used to seal the, the chip, and this is basically the flow in uh, maybe two ports of flow in and then one port of uh, liquid flow out. So if you have a chip, basically, you can uh, you can insert it into the uh, tip of the TEM holder and then the top chip, basically, and then uh, let the liquid to basically pass through this chip. And the liquid flow is typically some goes through this area, some could go through from outside of the chips, but all the system is basically already sealed. So this video is showing an example of the uh, TEM tip, and this is how liquid uh, electrolyte can be flow into the uh, TEM holder. This video shows an example of, of particles that are agglomerating or moving around within the liquid. So, so you have very uh, fine resolutions. You can get things, an uh, image in the order of, you know, uh, one nanometer uh, or um, maybe even low, lower than that. Here is showing an example of of some particles in the liquid which uh, are going to go under phase transformation. Um, it's an example of amorphous to crystalline phase transformation that we detected. And, uh, and uh, you can see here we have a resolution of about 200 nanometer. And uh, that gives you um, kind of a window to a new phenomenon that can happen at, at, at liquid states. and. Uh, and maybe interfaces between the solid and liquid. So, um, so this configuration has been tested by a variety of researchers. Uh, PNNL has done some work on this area. Um, a lot of work has been done at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, as well as Cornell University. So um, um, uh, there are some new information we have learned about heterogeneity of the uh, system about uh, how the kinetics of the SEI grew or lithium dendri dendritic grew that um, would be very um, in interesting for future applications of um, energy systems. Um, another configuration as I mentioned it would be to use these this MEMS based devices. It's, some of you might be interested to study solid state um, batteries and this is a nice configuration that allow you to basically deposit uh, solid state batteries including electrolytes, uh, cathode and anode system and uh, for many cases to do this uh, you would need to have access to focus ion beam uh, in order to nicely cut your uh, battery and then um, great care should be uh, uh, should be done in order to uh, transfer this to your um, battery uh, chip uh, and then do the uh, basically charge discharge profile status. Um, this video um, 
by folks at um, um, UC California, um, um, UC San Diego, they have done and, and they are looking to, they basically provide a nice view in terms of how you can uh, cut uh, your um, FEB sample um, to study these interfaces. This is an example of you know, the probe that you bring to uh, lift um, your, um, your cut sample. And uh, then the next step would be to transport this to the uh, grids or to the uh, system that you would need to uh, use that for the TM investigation. There are many often uh, we receive questions of what kind of samples we can uh, we can use for this sort of investigation. Um, Many of the cases I show you include nanowires, uh, but we have tested all kind of materials, nanoparticles, two-dimensional materials, tin films. So, so you, um, all these sample geometries are possible. The main requirement is that you have a tin sample which allow for electron to pass through it. So that's if you can get that um, uh, sort of requirement passed, then uh, the rest of the Analysis using this system would be uh, doable. This is an example of our collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab. In this work, we deposited a tin film on a half grid and we brought our electrode, which had some sort of sodium at the source. We brought it in contact with our uh, VUI sense system, and then we look into the progress of uh, uh, sodiation reaction front into the uh, tin film structure. Um, if you have nanoparticle, one simple way would be to deposit your nanoparticle on a half grid and then use a manipulator to make a contact between this half grid and, and your sample. And then you can look into the, the, the uh, kinetics or thermodynamic phase transformation that is ongoing uh, in these samples. Um, one of the important considerations when you do ele you use electron microscopy to study electrochemistry or electrochemical reactions is to be mindful about the artifacts that could be um, um, produced during imaging or spectroscopy analysis. So we call this typically electron beam effect. Um, it can have some uh, knockout image. It can have some sort of radiolysis. Um, so there are a variety of, of issues that could be associated with the electron beam. So electron beam, we need it for our imaging or chemical analysis. But at the same time, um, they can have some artifacts and, uh, and maybe counterproductive effects on, on the analysis we want to have. Um, examples, people have shown that uh, by electron beam, they could uh, uh, control or basically change the litiation behavior in the electrodes. People have looked into um, electron beam effect on the formation of SEI and, and the change in the behavior of SEI kinetics. Some people have looked into electrolyte decomposition under the effect of electron beam or some chemical litiation or electrochemical litiation associated with the electron beam effect. So there are a variety of um, ways that, that these issues have to be um, carefully um, addressed. Um, example of big issue if you are dealing with, uh, with uh, liquid electrolyte system, especially if you contain some sort of water into your electrolyte system, then you might have a, a, a radiolysis of water or the composition of electrolytes and during the radiolysis um, you might get lots of radicals, bubbles, gas, gas phases that are forming and that might totally change the electrochemical study that you intend to do. Um, so before I go to this slide, I'd like to mention that um, Although there are some negatives associated with this um, electron beam interaction with your samples, if 
you are careful in terms of controlling the dose rates of electron, then, uh, then you can um, mitigate or reduce its um, negative effects on your sample. Electron beam uh, analysis or team investigation has been, for many years, have been used for biological samples and very soft materials. So um, uh, there are lots of literature available for you to figure out how to control these issues and how to reduce uh, this effect. So this is not something that uh, is, is out of control or out of hand nowadays with the advancement of electron microscope. Controlling the dose rates and the controlling the electron beam rates become much easier and much more convenient, maybe compared to 10, 20 years ago. Um, we, oops, many years uh, that we have been doing uh, our electrochemical research, we have been working with um, groups that um, are, are mostly are looking at the battery applications and, and the larger scale applications. And there has been um, many cases we see nice correlation between what has been done through uh, electrochemical battery systems and in situ electrochemistry research. And this is an example of the anisotropic growth of uh, lithiation of silicon, which has been also observed by ex situ test. So there is a, a nice correlation between the two, and, and this is, in, in fact, an advice if you um, try to report interesting uh, in situ TEM results or, or TEM results associated with electrochemistry. It would be good to do some uh, ex situ test and see if the behavior we are observing may has uh, direct correlation. Um, I don't go too much to the details of this uh, sort of things, but we are able to control the beam. That there are several work we have already done and published in the literature by looking at um, electron beam effect, uh, um, basically blocking electron beam, doing electrochemistry, and turning the beam on and off. So we can make a good correlation between these two cases. There are some of the folks at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, they have looked into the. Uh, uh, some CV curves for the analysis and understanding of uh, the behavior of their electrodes. Uh, we beam on and off, and here you can see that uh, there is a little change as long as the beam dose is not uh, very high. And it's another example that has been done by another group. But in overall, um, there are several reviews and uh, strategies that have been discussed in the literature about what should be the dose rates and that is permittable depending on the electrolyte configurations. So, um, I'd like to, uh, to, to conclude the, the presentation by uh, giving you a comparison between, you know, uh, in which cases you can, it's better to use or advisable to use open cell versus sealed liquid cell systems. Um, uh, in my opinion, if you are interested to um, look into the uh, atomic behavior, if you are interested to know um, chemical change at, at very local level, at, at, at um, um, nanometer or, or angstrom level, then the open cell configuration is, is the best uh, capability for you. Um, if you are interested, for example, to look into the SCI or dendritic formation, then maybe um, you have to have the liquid basically flow and, and the liquid configuration, and maybe that's the right system for you to use. Um, but obviously, you're going to have some sort of loss in the resolution of imaging or, or chemistry. Um, you need to be worried about wettability. Sometimes the silicon nitride won't allow for the liquid to nicely forms as a film on the surface, so um, so that's something you need to play with the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity of that surface. Um, some of the composition of electrolyte you want to use might not be quite um, compatible with the materials you have used to build your device, so that has, that compatibility issue needs to be well uh, Study. 
Um, in many cases, for this configuration where you are going to have electrodes and microfabrication, then you need to go and use clean room to deposit your electrodes, and that can make things um, difficult. Or you might need to use FEB to, um, to put the, your samples uh, into the microfabricated device. So it makes it difficult, but on the other hand, you are able to do a little bit more quantitative electrochemical studies and maybe look into some interesting uh, issues that are not possible with the open cell configuration. But overall, uh, open cell configuration, although it cannot be very quantitative in terms of the electrochemical parameter, but it can give you uh, uh, access to dynamics of, of electrochemical actions at uh, atomic resolution. In the literature, there has been a variety of uh, materials that have been investigated. Um, this is a summary that, that we have provided. It has um, almost six or seven years uh, of uh, summary of materials that have been observed during these six or seven years. Something we see that is uh, missing in the literature, uh, maybe needs more attention in future studies. Solid state materials have been very few studies dealing with that. Um, still in the liquid state, radiolysis or um, sort of SCI formation, very few studies have been on that area. And maybe more attention on the new chemistries should be given in terms of maybe lithium oxygen or lithium sulfur systems or multivalent system also can maybe could be investigated with in situ configurations. But they're more challenging, and that's why there's less work on that area. But I think with the new development we have in the field, it makes sense to move a little bit to uh, more challenging systems. These are examples of the work that has been done on new chemistries. Uh, lithium sulfur, we worked with Argonne National Lab to do some of that work. Uh, lithium oxygen system, uh, um, that has been uh, another very recent publication dealing with the formation of uh, lithium superoxide or peroxide systems and uh, or multivalent ion intercalation which um, is quite interesting the observation they had in terms of seeing uh, different uh, intercalation versus conversion reaction associated with these systems. Um, as, a, as a final thought, I, I personally believe that uh, we can take advantage of new capabilities in the electron microscopy to further um, provide information to electrochemists in terms of what's going on at, at, at very small scales. For uh, many years, the ability to um, have electron microscopes with aberration corrected, that was a big deal and was a big motivation. But now that frontier um, has now pushed to a new limit. Um, now we have uh, the capabilities to uh, involve uh, holography, uh, ultra-fast cameras, low-dose cameras to do low-dose imaging at resolutions uh, um, it's far better than what we have, and also the time scale is far better than what we have. It's an example of, of one of our uh, work which we collaborated with with the University of Maryland, which we look into the nucleation of uh, sodium metal on two-dimensional materials, and we saw a very interesting liquidic state uh, involving with this uh, nucleation. And this work um, was obtained by cameras that can collect images at a speed of about uh, 1600 frames per second. Um, in some of the microscopes now, electron microscopes have capability to do uh, SIMS analysis. Um, there are very few microscopes that can do that, but if you can combine this with some of your electrochemical devices, I think you can get lots of information, especially about the SEI or, or other issues um, that are important. Um, few microscopes. Electron microscope have now Raman spectroscopy capability that which we now we can integrate it with the electron beam analysis. So this config coupling of um, spectroscopy techniques, Raman or cathodoluminescence, 
with electron beam investigation, I think that will provide new frontiers in the field. I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, funding uh, for my research, Oregon National Lab and National Science Foundation have been a uh, big, big help as well as also Department of Energy and I'd like to um, acknowledge this. And uh, if at any time you have any question about uh, the material I presented or uh, you're seeking for some collaboration about the material system that you are interested, please feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to um, uh, be in touch with you. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to, to present an overview of the field of electron microscopy and in-situ electron microscopy for electrochemistry research. I focus more on, on battery investigation, but the same concepts could be used for other electrochemical devices, uh, and, uh, and maybe that would be um, very helpful for your research. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, I wish I could be with you uh, for this workshop, but I hope you have a great time. Uh, during the rest of the week, and uh, we're going to have a, a TM uh, demo for you, um, I think, um, um, in, in a few hours, and you can observe some of the, um, uh, the reactions and some of the behaviors that I show in my presentation. You can observe some of those results, uh, hopefully, during the TM. Thank you very much, and uh, have a great day.